Hey folks, Rich here at rcandforward.com. Thanks for checking out this video on the FMS BF-109. This is another Banana Hobby uh, FMS airplane in the 1400 millimeter Warbird series. And to date, it has become my absolute favorite simply because of its performance. It's shaped like a bullet, it flies like a rocket, and I just love having a high performance, fast Warbird to fly that maneuvers well. It uh, probably has the best vertical performance of most of the Warbirds, uh, of the 1400 millimeter Warbirds. Uh, because of the power, uh, the streamlined fuselage, and the nice big uh, propeller uh, up front. Not only does this airplane just fly fantastic, as you can see from the video, it looks great and it builds well. Uh, the, the, the camo detail, the paint scheme they picked out for this, uh, they got it right because it has such good color contrast between the green, the white, and the yellow, and the gray wings. Uh, that whether you have a, a, a blue sky or whether you have a dark sky or whether you have trees in the background, it'll stand out in almost anything, so it's real easy to see. Uh, the, the, the coolest feature as far as the way it looks, I think, though, is the, is the spinner itself. The half white, or sorry, half yellow, half black spinner is sort of mesmerizing as it's spinning and it's coming at you. And it, uh, it really lights up uh, the airplane and, uh, and uh, just make, gives it a stellar look. Uh, the other thing about it, too, is the squadron insignias. They did such a good job with the devil's head, the heart, the little shield here, and uh, the other markings on it. It's just such a good-looking standout airplane. When it comes to building this thing, really, really simple. Uh, Two-spar design, so it's of the, the newer of the FMS airplanes, which makes it super, super rigid. Uh, also, it has other internal spars that are uh, molded into the, into the wing, uh, and that explains why the plane maneuvers so well. It does super loops, super rolls, super nice loops, super nice rolls, uh, and just has a real rigid feel to it when you're flying it for a foam airplane. Uh, tail, real simple to put together. The rudder is already part of the fuselage, so you don't even need to glue it on. There's one fiberglass uh, beam that runs from side to side that you put the two halves of the elevator on uh, with some contact cement, and you're good to go. Probably one of the best fitting canopies, too that I've, I've, I've had on any of these uh, Warbirds. It's very solid and the magnets are, are really nice and hold it in place. It has a nice tongue and groove design uh, up front. Uh, now with all the, the wonderful things I've said so far about this airplane, it has a, a couple of drawbacks and that's what I'm going to address in the video. Nothing major, but, uh, but things that are, that are indigenous to this design and to a 109 specifically. Um, Probably the biggest caveat, although the plane flies fantastic, it's got great performance, it's super maneuverable, it's super fast, um, it, uh, it's tricky to take off and land. That's how a BF-109 is though. You watch any YouTube videos of them taking off and landing, and particularly on grass, uh, takeoffs you have to be very careful, uh, and that's because uh, what you have is a narrow wheelbase, the wheels are close together, uh, it has a very small rudder combined with a whole ton of power and a big prop up front. So taking off, you just want to ease the power forward and as the tail comes up, you're going to be feeding some right rudder in uh, when you take off. And when you land, uh, you have to be very careful, especially on grass. On cement, it's not too bad because you have a nice smooth surface. But even if you do a nice touchdown on this air, with this airplane on grass, if it hits a bump after the fact, it'll start bouncing and sometimes it'll go up on one wheel, which real 109s did. So. Uh, just something to, to be careful of. Uh, but, but aside from that, uh, again, this would be my first choice of any airplane uh, of the 1400 millimeters just because uh, uh, it's just so much fun to fly. I don't mind the challenge of taking off and landing. It's, it's actually quite fun to do. Um, the, the other things I'm going to point out in this video, uh, a couple of changes. Uh, I'm going to mostly go into all the parts of the airplane. I'll talk about things I liked and didn't like. Uh, anybody that has this airplane, or is thinking about getting one of these airplanes, I've got some pretty significant but very simple changes that you're going to want to make uh, to uh, help the airplane actually, the, the speed control and the battery, actually cool down a little bit. There's plenty of cooling intake on the front for the speed controller, and there's plenty of exit cooling down here to get the air out. But what I found is, is if you're using a larger battery like I used in mine, uh, you're, you're going to tend to, you can tend to block uh, the cooling in the middle part of the fuselage from actually getting out. So you can get a lot more heat build up and it's a little harder on the speed controller. So I've got some real simple changes and nice upgrades for getting the cooling flowing in this airplane um, through the airplane 
uh, much, much better. But overall, guys, I just I love this airplane. I just can't stop saying uh, enough good things about it. But uh, the video is going to show you some things that will be very, very helpful to anybody that owns this airplane and uh, anybody that's thinking about getting it. Anyway, guys, without further delay, let's get on with the video. To start off the review of the uh, FMS BF109, uh, I thought we'd take a look at the outside of the box. The cardboard outer box it came in uh, was in real nice shape. Uh, I noticed here at the end that the uh, left side of the box has a little bit of compression. Uh, the only difference in this box compared to some of the others, it's a little bit uh, uh, skinnier and a little bit taller, probably due to the nature of the airplane. Anyway, let's get inside and uh, take a look at the parts. As we look inside the uh, foam crate, uh, we notice that uh, the box definitely has a much different shape than the other ones. Uh, again, probably because it's a skinnier airplane, but everything looks like it's uh, pretty well packaged inside. Let's go ahead and get all the parts out and uh, we'll show you what we got. Here's the layout of all the parts that came out of the box. Overall, I'm real impressed with the, uh, the quality of this kit. Uh, one of the biggest standout features is just the, uh, the color and the, uh, the way that the colors contrast. This is a really bright and a real uh, kind of beautiful paint job they put on this thing. Uh, the white in particular, uh, which is nice, the white part on the fuselage is actually painted white and they didn't just leave it the foam color. So uh, definitely thumbs up on, on that detail. Also, uh, I, I noticed this is one of, the, one of the fewer of the FMS kits uh, that actually has the, the rudder attached, already part of the fuselage. So that's one less thing to glue on. Anyway, uh, let me uh, specifically show you some of the features uh, I like on the airplane. We'll get close up with some of the parts and uh, show you some of the details and some of the things I like about it. Starting off with the fuselage, guys, this is a real nice quality part. Uh, I'm real happy, as you can see, with the, the detail of this thing. Uh, all the decals are, uh, are highly detailed, and uh, the paint job just has such a nice contrast to it. Uh, real overall happy with the, uh, with the overall quality of, uh, of the fuselage. You can see some of the gun detailing in here. They did a really super job. Uh, with getting the, um, uh, the guns nice and scale looking. Uh, the scoop on the side, which you actually do glue on, but it also provides good cooling because air does go in there for the ESC and the battery compartment. Uh, you can also see here the, uh, uh, the exhaust pipes. Very detailed stuff, guys. Real impressed with uh, how they did all this. Uh, the scoop under here, the nose, you can see uh, they definitely, uh, uh, it's definitely a functional scoop. It actually will cool down uh, the, the ESC and uh, let air pass through, which will actually pass all the way back to the back of the fuselage here, where it exhausts out these uh, nice exhaust ports. Um, also, the wing mounting bolt uh, positions, um, like all other FMS planes, one of the things I like is they come in from the top side. So you can be, be pretty confident flying this thing inverted because you have a nice um, uh, back plate on the inside that uh, helps keep, uh, keep the wing on. Uh, but uh, really super nice quality as we move on to the back here. Uh, we'll take a look here at the rudder section. You can see that's already attached and everything. Uh, foam rudder hinge. Uh, all of the um, uh, push rods are installed. And uh, again, nice feature that they are putting these uh, little bits of uh, fuel tubing on here to keep, uh, keep the clevises attached. Uh, and uh, they're starting to use the newer style clevises on these planes too. So uh, taking a look underneath. Uh, you can see the retract unit under here, the tail retract, and it looks tail retract. It looks like they used a, an RC Lander brand again, and uh, they used this uh, uh, centering mechanism on the servo, very similar to the uh, uh, P38 Lightning uh, uh, video that I did. Same kind of mechanism where this little pin, when it, the gear extends, it uh, inserts into that uh, little V-shaped groove, and that gives you steering, and it disengages it when the uh, gear retracts. But uh, I'll flip the fuselage over here. Uh, same on the other side, nice detail, nice paint job, very cool pilot in there. Uh, they're also painting the inside of the uh, cockpits all black and uh, put a little instrument panel that you can kind of see right in there. So good detail on the pilot, good detail on the uh, cockpit. And uh, you open it up and you can see uh, we have magnets down in here to hold everything in place. Uh, the servo tray, you can see the ESC buried deep in there. And a nice big battery compartment. I'm hoping uh, this will take uh, even a 4,000 pack. We'll see how it goes. But uh, anyway, guys, uh, overall, this fuselage, real nice condition. Uh, there is one negative that I do want to point out, one thing that I didn't specifically like about this one, and this is something that I check on all of my airplanes when I first get them. If you look straight ahead uh, at the, uh, the motor, usually I look to see how centered okay, is this motor. And it looks like it's off to the left a little bit, so the, the, uh, 
the uh, uh, spinner may not quite align with this uh, the, the fuselage. We'll see when we get it on there if it looks okay because a lot of these motors, as you can see, they're angled off to the uh, right and uh, they're also angled uh, down a little bit usually to give you a little bit of right and down thrust to uh, uh, kind of help eliminate or reduce some of the left turning tendencies of, uh, of these planes. But, but looking at this one, this one looks like it is a little bit far off to the right here, you know, pointing off in this direction. So we'll see how that uh, spinner alignment uh, works out. And uh, if that uh, ends up being a problem, th then it, it won't affect the flying of it. But uh, it's just something that happened in the production process where they didn't get the firewall quite bolted on right. But uh, anyway, aside from that, Overall, super nice airplane, guys. Very nice detail and uh, definitely a really nice quality, uh, nice quality fuselage. Next up, I thought I'd show you the spinner and the uh, alignment issue with this particular one that I was talking about. Uh, this may be just a fluke from the factory, but you can see how it's kind of not lined up exactly and it's got kind of an angle to it. It's not quite, uh, the spinner black back play is not, client, not quite lined up. Um, with the, uh, the, the, the surface of the cowl here. So if you look at it sideways, it's actually pretty good. They did a pretty decent job. It lines up pretty much okay with the top and the bottom. Uh, there is a little bit of a spinner gap, but uh, 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 you notice with the spinner here, there's one screw that goes through the middle uh, that will bolt this thing right in. Uh, it's a real nice spinner. Also, it has the standard pretty much hex drive that uh, most of uh, the FMS airplanes have. But uh, uh, later in the video, I will have, uh, I hopefully will have a couple of solutions for you on this. I already have a couple of ideas in mind on how to fix this if you get one like this. Occasionally I've got a few airplanes where the spinner's misaligned and uh, there's some tricks you can use to, uh, to straighten these up and line them out. If they're really bad, you can always contact the manufacturer, whether it be Banana Hobbies or whoever, um, that, uh, that they can probably send you another fuselage or something that lines up better. But uh, uh, but for the most part, I got a couple tricks in mind, and I'll talk about that a little later in the video, how to kind of correct this up. Here's another feature that's a little bit different about this airplane uh, when compared to some of the other FMS airplanes, is that uh, each elevator comes in a half. Uh, they're all, of course, foamed hinged like the rest of them, but, uh, uh, but it comes in two halves, and you can see the spar groove underneath, and they give you a fiberglass spar that's actually a beam um, uh, rather than uh, a, uh, a, um, a tube. And uh, essentially what you do is you, you probably glue one half off. We'll see how the instructions go with it, but you probably glue one half in. And you can see right here with the actual uh, uh, rudder part itself, uh, you can see that there's a, there's a hole right there for the spar and for the elevator to fit through. So you probably plug one end in, at one end in, and uh, you go ahead and uh, you slide it through, and then you put the other half on. So again, a slightly different design feature uh, when compared to some of the other, other uh, FMS airplanes. Uh, but it's a two-half system with a spar that you glue, and it looks like a real good construction. It should be easy to get uh, in place. Here's a look at uh, the left wing. Uh, overall, real impressed with the uh, quality, the nice paint job, and the uh, detail on this thing. Uh, also, you can tell that uh, uh, this is one of the newer of the FMS airplanes because it has uh, two spars that run through it. Uh, fiberglass spars that uh, run through these fiberglass channels, and uh, uh, the newer airplanes with the two spars have very rigid wings compared to some of the older foam style ones that uh, uh, are kind of flexible. Uh, this is one of the greatest things they've done to these airplanes because they now fly a little bit more like traditional balsa airplanes and glow power airplanes that are much more rigid. Instead of flexing so much, uh, they have very, very rigid wings. So we can't wait to really fly, can't, really can't wait to fly this thing. It should be a whole lot of fun. Um, also, uh, notice the wiring harness, wiring loom comes in through here pretty uh, easily. Everything is, uh, is uh, assembled nicely. Uh, they have this colored tape used to cover over everything, all the channels, your wingtip light and everything. Uh, and I really like the way they match the tape color to cover up all those servo channels. Um, noticing the landing gear here, uh, they have used an RC Lander unit for this. And RC Lander does use the real nice, does have real nice retracts. Also, this one has a metal trunnion, so uh, real happy with that overall. Uh, looks like the wheel is a uh, custom wheel for a BF-109 as well, so scale detail, nice painted hubcap and, and everything. You can see your aileron servo is already pre-mounted in here. Uh, your flap servo is pre-mounted and uh, everything is hinged uh, you know, on foam hinges. Now, up for one of the coolest details that I've seen uh, lately on a, on a foam plane 
is this flap system. The flap system, flap is set up right here and it mounts and connects right here with these nice flap hinges uh, that, uh, that they're using on all their airplanes and they're painting them the same color as the fuselage too so it's really nice. But you notice this dual flap system all operates together and it's very very a very very cool detail how this comes together. There's a little junction here in the center where they used a servo type horn with these little uh, plastic brackets and uh, link the servos together, uh, link, link the flaps together. So you have a single servo that controls this flap and then it also controls the, uh, the outboard flap. So there's sort of an inboard and outboard flap. So you got a split flap and a plane flap all operated from one switch and one servo. So very, very cool detail uh, they're getting on these things, guys. Anyway, overall, real impressed with this wing, guys. Uh, this should be a great flying airplane. Now, here's another feature that I'm liking. They also included two complete sets of props, not just, um, not just uh, you know, four blades and a spare. Actually, there's two blades. Now, this might have been a mistake from the factory or something, um, but, uh, uh, but overall, it is nice that they give you two sets. There's two sets, actually, and one spare, it looks like. There's three in here and, uh, and four in here. Uh, I hope this is a, a permanent change and not just a mistake because um, usually when you ding up a prop on the ground you usually break more than one blade and then you don't have enough replacement. So if, uh, if this is something FMS is doing, if you're watching this, uh, definitely give us two sets, man. That really helps out uh, when we break a couple of blades on the runway. We can keep on flying if we have the spares. And also uh, the, the, uh, the, the, either the drop tank here or the bomb that they included underneath they're using all these newer style um, uh, latching mechanisms that you can get your this uh, this bomb on or drop tank whatever it is get it on and off real easy uh, you can fly with it fly without it and you don't have to worry about it gluing uh, gluing it on or anything like that also included with the plane like all other FMS planes are all the uh, wiring harnesses that you need uh, some of them look like they're triple Y harnesses some are just double Y harnesses and extensions screws a uh, bag of long screws and other plastic wing brackets, looks like these are wing plates and so forth, a uh, screwdriver and of course uh, a tube of contact cement. And last but not least the instruction manual, this is something pretty much standard I'm putting in all my videos now. Um, uh, it may be repetitious for some of you if you've seen some of my other videos, but, but uh, real nice detailed instruction manual guys. Uh, they really go over this stuff step by step. Uh, the English is uh, pretty darn good and they're relatively easy to understand and uh, real, uh, real good instructions for putting this together. Also, of course, uh, what I like that they're doing is put, including an ESC manual uh, so you can program your ESC. Uh, all the instructions are in here, how to reprogram it if you put in a wrong setting or even at a later date if you end up crashing the airplane, the airplane's gone, you still have a good ESC to use. Now you have a manual that you can uh, program uh, uh, your ESC with or reprogram it or do whatever you need to with it. So it's a nice feature to have that they include with the airplane. Anyway guys, uh, overall looks like a real nice plane. Let me go ahead and get on with the building of it and uh, I'll show you some of the details and some of the things that I find in it that I can either improve or, or change or help you out. Uh, anyway, let's get on with the building. One tip I have that, uh, you highlight, that I highly recommend uh, using uh, that they do on a lot of other models but didn't seem to do on this one. When it comes to the horns and the clevises for the elevator, the rudder, uh, even the, uh, the flaps and the ailerons, uh, they have you put the airplane together and then put them on, which is a real pain in the butt to do. Uh, I would suggest installing all your clevises uh, on your, or all your horns on your control surfaces first uh, and installing all of your rods and then put the airplane together. It just makes uh, it a whole lot easier. It's a lot easier to uh, install all these things when the airplane is not all in one big piece. Here's a pretty good technique I have for installing the elevator. As you can see, I already uh, put one half on uh, and have the spar going through. Um, uh, you can use epoxy or CA or whatever you want. Uh, I chose to just use the contact cement on this because uh, the structure of this thing is actually pretty tough just the way it is and uh, the tail spar here really just needs something tacky to keep it in place here. Uh, but what I found was is a real good way to do this is to go ahead and take the glue and starting at one end just sort of insert it and you can see here how the glue just sort of if you hold it down like this it will just flow down the channel there and as it's flowing down the channel pretty much the best tool to use to keep this all nice and neat is really just a popsicle stick and very carefully just kinda push it all down 
and move it all the way down to the bottom and get the whole get the whole channel um, uh, you know with some glue in it and just keep inserting it through this end here and just let it all flow down. If you try and put it directly in uh, it's probably going to get all over and tear up the paint and mess it all up but if you very carefully little by little flow it down here okay and then go ahead and just channel it on down there with a popsicle stick or just a somewhat, something similar like a little piece of wood like this it'll make a nice um, uh, neat uh, little glue fillet in there. Now with the glue in the trench of your of the uh, spar trench for the elevator, uh, the next thing you want to do is just take some of the contact cement and very carefully brush it on only the inside portion uh, of, uh, of the slot here where the elevator is supposed to go in. If you put it on this part uh, of the elevator or you put it on the spar, you're going to end up with a whole bunch of uh, glue and goop all over this thing and it'll end up taking the paint off. So uh, by doing it this way, you'll uh, be able to avoid uh, any of that mess. The next thing you want to do is just very carefully just install the elevator, push it into the slot, and then very carefully just insert your spar into the slot, and you'll have some glue ooze out, but for the most part, you'll have a nice uh, clean installation this way without glue getting all over and tearing all the paint off. Now as a clamping technique to help keep the spar down in the groove, what I use is uh, two pieces of uh, just wood and a clamp and then uh, right down here take either a small scrap of wood or in this case uh, I just cut the end off of a tie wrap because it was uh, kind of square and uh, use the clamp okay, to, uh, uh, on the wood to keep uh, the, the uh, clamp from dinging up the foam and this will put pressure on the spar and it will drive the spar down into the slot and uh, help keep it in there. Just let it dry that way and when you're done you can unclamp it and you'll have a very uh, nicely seated spar. As previously discussed we can see that the spinner is a little out of alignment. Up and down from this view is not so bad but uh, when we look at it from the top we can see that uh, it's a little bit out of alignment there. You can see it's shifted uh, uh, kind of off to the right side of the airplane so uh, here's how we're going to fix that. Now the first thing you're going to do is remove the prop and spinner and then you're going to go ahead and remove this cowl. It's a really nice uh, plastic molded uh, cowling. There's one screw in the side right here that you take out and one here on the other side and you just remove that and uh, remove those two screws and then take this, uh, take it off. Uh, and then there's four screws here that hold the, uh, the, the motor mount in place and uh, you can see the speed controller runs back in there through these wires. It's actually not a bad time to just check these wires uh, and make sure that they're uh, you know, connected. Actually, one of mine was completely uh, disconnected, and if it is, you just uh, you know re reconnect it in place. Uh, and also, I, I put some uh, some insulating tape. This is actually just some hinge tape, but you can use electrical tape or whatever you have. Uh, uh, to you notice here between these two uh, heat shrinks, there's actually some metal showing on the connector. So to help insulate that, I just put that around there. But anyway, back to the motor. You can see that the mount actually is kind of bent. It has a bend right here and you know you put a straight edge over these it's, it doesn't even mount really too flush so I think they just bent this mount wrong and you can see here where their machine was bending it and it probably just tweaked this thing so you can either bend it back into place um, or uh, in this case we actually need to tilt the motor farther off to the left side of the airplane so uh, in order to do that the easiest way is to just take uh, some washers and a little bit of um, uh, contact cement and just build it up on one side. And you can see right here uh, I just attached uh, a couple of washers and you use as many washers as you need. In this case I'm going to use two on each side and by screwing this back into place it's going to angle the motor farther off to the left like we need to. Now we can apply this to any other of the FMS airplanes that have this style of motor mount. Um, you could angle the motor up by putting you know two washers on the bottom. Uh, you could angle the motor down by having uh, you know two screws here. You could also angle it kind of diagonally if you just want to put one washer on one corner. So sometimes you just need to, to, to move the motor a little bit and you just put the washers where you need to. And you can use metal washers, plastic washers, nylon washers, uh, whatever you want to use. But uh, anyway, this is the way that you can, one way that you can angle this motor and get it uh, uh, where you need it to be. When you're done uh, with getting your angle set, you go ahead and you uh, put the four screws back into place, refit your cowl, uh, and uh, check your spinner alignment. And if it needs to move a little bit more, uh, then you can apply more, uh, more washers if you need to use them. 
Uh, if you need too many washers, then uh, the thing may be like way out of alignment. And you also might want to consider even using longer screws if you start using too many washers, because then you won't have enough, enough screw going, uh, going into the uh, plastic. But uh, anyway, a very simple way to do this. Taking a quick look at the uh, motor and shaft alignment before we put the spinner on, you can see that that motor is just about dead center on there. And it still has a right thrust and a down thrust in it like it was intended to from the factory. I think in this case it just had a bent mount. Uh, it wasn't quite uh, fabricated correctly at the factory. Um, if you need to, you can contact Banana Hobbies or wherever you purchase the airplane from. And uh, they'll probably be more than happy to send you a mount. But uh, as you can see, you really don't need to fix, uh, you don't, don't need to you know, deal with customer service too much on these kinds of things. It's real easy to fix with, like I said, with washers and so forth and just uh, get this thing lined up. Now let's take a look at how it looks with the spinner on. Now after reassembling everything, you can see we have a much nicer uh, spinner alignment. You can see both sides pretty much line up nice on the sides. If you view this from the side, you're going to see that it's all lined up nicely. Now there's one more thing we can do and we can just we can eliminate some of this uh, spinner gap in here and bring the spinner a little tighter, tighter to the fuselage and it's very simple. Um, all we have to do is, uh, you notice right down here that uh, the uh, hex drive uh, on the prop drive here uh, is uh, very short. Okay, it's probably about six millimeters or so and uh, when you look at the propeller this uh, little section here sticks way out. So all we have to do really is just grab a sanding bar or, or something and just carve away some of this. So we'll just kind of sand it down a few millimeters, make it flatter, and uh, we should get a really nice uh, nice gap on there. Let's go ahead and do that. We'll see how it looks. By far the best method that I have found uh, to sand uh, this center section uh, down and to keep it flush uh, with the uh, back plate of the spinner, and you want it to be flush so the spinner doesn't, so the prop doesn't wobble uh, as, it, as it spins. Uh, but to keep this thing flush, uh, you're going to take a piece of wood, and I use this plywood. It's either 1 16th or uh, 5 64th, uh, and you'll have to use uh, whatever you need uh, according to what your spinner is or how your uh, spinner gap is. Uh, because, you know, the motor mount is mounted inside a foam, and uh, yours may be sticking out farther or closer in, so you need to use whatever wood's appropriate uh, for, for your particular case. But uh, once you get that on there, you take a sanding bar and you put it right over top and you sand it so it goes flush. And what you're going to find is, uh, you want to make sure you don't sand too much off of it, but, but uh, it'll protect your edges of the spinner from getting scraped up, and more importantly, it's going to make sure you get a nice uh, even sand out of this thing. So uh, once you're done, uh, you can remove this and try it out. So uh, by using a, a steady thickness of wood like that, you'll get a nice um, uh, flush um, uh, sanding of this uh, inner hub. Also, just as a side note, you can see uh, I had one of these prop, or this whole prop unit was way out of balance. So uh, there's a really good edge right here where you can mount lead weights um, to balance the, uh, the whole propeller out. Okay, here's the final uh, lineup of the spinner, and it doesn't get too much sweeter than this, guys. Uh, you can see we got a nice thin gap between there. At the top here it lines up nicely. At the bottom here it lines up nicely too. If we go over to the top and take a look at this thing, uh, we can also see the uh, right side lines up nice and the left side lines up nice. And by filing away a little bit of that center hub, we get a nice uh, spinner gap that's not too wide and it's not too tight. You want to be careful not to get too tight with it because you do want to remember that this is an electric motor that's mounted in foam. Okay, It's mounted in a, in a plastic uh, firewall with foam, so it's going to flex a little bit like this, so you don't want to get it too close. But it looks like we got a nice compromise and a nice tight uh, spinner gap that really looks good on that thing. Anyway, guys, you can apply this again. You can apply this fix to almost any of these FMS planes if you get one that's slightly out of alignment. Most of the time you get it from the factory. Um, they're usually pretty much dead center. This is really the first one I've seen that was just out of alignment, and it, like I said, it was just—I think it was just a fluke of that motor mount. But anyway, we got a nice, uh, nice true spinner on there now. As I was adjusting the uh, motor mount by adding washers uh, to get the uh, spinner to line up, uh, I noticed with my motor that as I rotated, it was a little bit rough, and uh, so I decided uh, to go ahead and inspect it. And this is something you can do on. Uh, on uh, any any of these electric motors. It's pretty simple. All you do is just remove this set screw here and uh, you pull that uh, wheel collar off and you want to make sure that when you put it back on that you put this uh, little recessed part, this little thin edge, back on straight, uh, back on uh, downward towards the bearing. The reason for that is because is that, uh, that thin area is designed to contact only the inner 
portion of the ball race so it doesn't grind against the outside of the case. So just make sure you put it back on right and of course make sure that you get it on that flat spot, the, uh, the set screw uh, lined up with that flat spot. But anyway, once you got this thing apart, uh, all you really need to do is just pull this thing apart very carefully, just yank it apart. And uh, the magnets are one of the things that uh, help keep it in there and make it hard to get off. Um, and one thing you want to be very careful of is that washer down in there. There's a brass washer. Let's see if I can get that off. There it is. Um, you do not want to lose this. Sometimes it will stick to the front of the motor, but if you're not unaware of this washer and you lose it, when you put this motor back on, the, the black part of the housing here is going to probably scrape against uh, 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 this uh, uh, back portion, the, the aluminum back of the, uh, of the motor. Um, and also, you'll probably end up scraping the inside of the bearing and probably ruin the motor. motor. So be very careful, again, not to lose uh, this brass uh, washer. Anyway, once you're inside, guys, some of the things you're going to want to inspect is just really the magnets. Just kind of go through the inside of this thing and uh, make sure magnets aren't moving. That could be causing some scraping. But uh, I already looked at this thing, and this, this one's good. Uh, nothing's coming off there. But here's where I found the problem. As, you're go as you look at, inspect the motor, just kind of go around this thing, you can see really quickly that there's one wire here in the winding that's sticking out. Uh, and that is what is grinding. The magnet is uh, kind of contacting that. So um, this is something that's pretty common. No need to call customer service for this kind of thing if you get a grinding. Uh, just uh, you know, disassemble your motor easily like this and then just push that winding back in and uh, just sort of press it down in there into the rest of the windings. And uh, it's not a bad idea to uh, look at this top section here where you can see where the winding kind of goes and it's a little bit loose. Uh, just push that back in and if you need to take some contact cement, put some contact cement or something on the inside of this to kind of help or even some CA or something. You can even drop a little bit of CA right there and just keep that winding, uh, push that winding back in and you're good to go. And then just further inspect the rest of this thing. Uh, make sure there's nothing sticking out. And uh, now just reassemble your motor. It's uh, pretty simple. Just make sure again that washer is on the, uh, or that uh, brass washer is back on the inside of this thing. You can push this thing back on and it'll actually pull it back on with the magnets. And now I notice that when I spin it, all that grinding is gone. So uh, anyway, uh, you just find your uh, flat spot, which it looks like it's right in there. And uh, you go ahead and just uh, put your washer or your uh, wheel collar back on again with the, with the thin part pointing towards the, uh, towards the bearing so it contacts that inner race of the bearing and then go ahead and tighten it down. And then your motor's ready to be reinstalled. Uh, I haven't had too much problems with these uh, 4250 580s. In fact, this is the first one I ever found with an issue. But uh, you know, the models are so inexpensive, they're $170, $200, $200 or so. So you know, it, it, it doesn't really almost help to contact customer service with some of these kinds of things. It's just easier just to kind of take it apart and look at it yourself. But uh, anyway, hopefully you'll find this useful in getting into your motors and uh, it's a good way to just kind of check it out and inspect it. Uh, it'll save you a lot of hassle later. One great feature on this airplane, guys, is the, uh, the center gravity position in the manual shows it to be at approximately uh, 80 millimeters uh, aft of the uh, leading edge at the root, which actually puts your center of gravity right, uh, if you start from right here back after the leading edge, 80 millimeters goes back to right here, and that's just aft of this uh, circle, uh, and actually just about dead right on this line right here. So you can use either one of these spots, this line or just right about here at the front edge of this circle. Uh, to balance the airplane at. Now this airplane has a huge, a, a pretty long nose and a long nose compartment. So you want to um, basically uh, put the battery in a position, move it forward or aft, okay, and get it in the position you want uh, and lock it down with the battery strap and then flip the airplane over upside down and just balance it with your fingers on these points right here or just right approximately here where about 80 is. And once it balances there, that's the position you're going to keep your battery and uh, it does depend on the size and the weight of your battery, so you want to find the position for your particular battery that balances uh, right on that spot. But this is nice having these visual cues because you can put any size battery you want in the airplane now and you can change from, from bigger battery or heavier battery to smaller battery and, uh, and uh, you have a very quick reference point. You can install your battery, flip the airplane upside down, make sure it balances okay, and if it doesn't, you can just adjust your battery accordingly and then go fly. In order to balance the airplane at the uh, 80 millimeter mark like we just talked about, you have to really consider uh, what you're going to do with the uh, uh, inside uh, battery compartment of this airplane. You can see up here the, the two batteries, uh, the 2650, uh, this is actually a 30C pack, they recommend a 20. I use this and I also use the uh, 4000 milliamp 30C pack which is significantly bigger but these planes uh, get a little more punch out of this battery and uh, of course uh, some more flight time with it as well. 
But uh, some things you have to consider, if you're using a small battery with the stock speed controller, you don't really have a problem. Uh, but if you're using a bigger battery, if you lay it flat, uh, not like this, but if you lay it flat, you block almost all the exit cooling. Uh, the air comes in through the front and it can't get past the battery. It gets all blocked. So I found that by putting it up on its side like this, um, I now have plenty of cooling okay, coming around both sides of the battery and that air can flow all the way back here. The other thing you have to change is uh, you notice where my primary receiver is and then my secondary receiver is back on that back wall. You can see this little bulkhead. There used to be another one right here that I removed and I also removed this one. I just kind of left it there so I can show you what it looks like. Um, but if you leave those bulkheads in there, it just creates a wall that the air still can't get out of the airplane. So you remove those things, you'll free this whole area up for air to flow all the way back through here and they can come out the, uh, the, the cooling holes, uh, the exit holes in the underside of the airplane. So this is a good way to really free up uh, the inside of the airplane and make it cool much better and still let you use a, a nice big battery. Now depending on the size of the battery is going to determine how far forward or back that you need to put, uh, put the battery. If it's a lighter battery it may need to go a little farther forward. If it's a heavier battery, it may need to go a little, little farther back. But the big thing here is, is you don't want to block uh, the cooling, okay, the exhaust cooling, the exit cooling coming around the battery if your battery is too wide. Now, another thing I had to do to get this thing all to fit is the uh, canopy. I had to just make a little cut in here. No big deal. Easy to do with a hobby knife and, uh, and uh, a sanding bar. And you can see that uh, that all fits in there really nice. And you'll never even know that you made the modification. But... The big advantage here is you now have uh, very good cooling running through this whole thing where uh, between the bulkheads and the flat battery, uh, you were, uh, you, pretty much the, the cooling, the exit cooling was getting blocked in this airplane. Now let me show you a couple other places where it's a really good idea to put a little extra cooling in this airplane. On the side of the airplane you have this uh, dummy, uh, which I believe on the real airplane is actually a turbocharger scoop. but. Um, FMS actually made this uh, a functional uh, cooling scoop and uh, I hadn't glued mine on yet but you can see here that the air actually does flow all the way through there and uh, helps assist in cooling and you can see in here it actually does go into the side of the airplane and it flows all the way back here and uh, runs through the top and helps cool helps get uh, nice cool air in there but if you notice here I trimmed a lot away right around here and it's a good idea because what happened was is before I cut that stuff away all of this area was actually being blocked by um, uh, by, uh, by a bunch of foam that was here so if you can get in there just with a hobby knife and trim a lot of this away just right along this edge you'll make this scoop much more efficient and much more uh, assistive to cooling the entire thing then you can go ahead and glue the thing on and uh, now you're going to have some pretty good cooling going through there. Last but not least, uh, one area that I decided to add some cooling to this airplane was the, uh, the cowling. And I noticed that there's, uh, there's plenty of cooling between, being, between this underneath scoop and this side scoop for the speed controller, but there's absolutely no cooling uh, for this motor. And in fact, for those of you who may have the airplane, uh, I trimmed all this away. This used to be really close to the to the size of the motor and it was all kind of closed up here and uh, no way for air to get in there. So uh, it's a very large spinner on this plane so you can see I took a Dremel tool and I cut all the way around here and I sanded this and widened this out quite a bit and uh, just made it uh, 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 a little more conducive to, to cooling maybe around the spinner gap a little bit. But more importantly even than this you can see down in here this channel that I cut and I put a hole underneath to allow air to get into there to the motor compartment and I think this is really critical guys to help this thing uh, cool down a little bit and it's just plastic so with a Dremel tool you can cut through it and you can make a diagonal uh, scoop up there and now at least you're getting some air uh, into the uh, motor compartment where absolutely none was getting in there before. So it can now get into the motor compartment and it can flow back through to where the speed controller is and get some good cooling going into this, uh, into this motor compartment. After setting up the interior of the airplane and getting the battery set up uh, uh, where I wanted it and everything, just like we just saw, uh, I noticed that after flying this thing and running it up on a watt meter, I was actually getting a significant, uh, significantly higher amp draw out of this airplane than I was with the um, uh, FW190. 
um, which is kind of strange because uh, it's the same 65 amp speed controller, uh, same motor, uh, same batteries that I was using, and even the same propeller blades because the FW190 and the uh, and the um, and the BF109 here uh, have the exact same propeller. Now, after scratching my head for a little while, I thought about you know the, the drag of the airplanes are different. And this airplane is actually a little smaller, probably produces even less drag. So this plane probably should even have less numbers. But here's the revelation I made, and again, it took me a little bit of thinking to do this, but it's actually a simple reason, and and, and actually the answer was right in front of my face. If you notice here, um, this is the uh, FW190 propeller, same propeller blades and everything, but the key is, is looking at the hub. Notice that the, the spinner hub on the BF109 is much larger, the one on the 190 is smaller, and on the, on the BF109, the prop blades are mounted much farther away from the, uh, from the center of the, 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 the motor shaft. And uh, if you put them on top of each other and mount them both on the same shaft, you'll notice that even though they're the same propeller blades, the prop is actually much bigger, about a half inch longer here uh, on the BF109 than on the FW190. So what that translates to is a spinner or a propeller on the FW190 that is about 13 inches. And you're looking at about a 14 inch propeller on the BF109. So same motor, same speed controller, same battery, but you're drawing more amps because you got a, a, a bigger propeller now, 14 inch propeller instead of a 13. So that explains the excessive amp draw. Now, uh, if you are going to run the stock battery, which I think they suggest a 20C, 2600 uh, milliamp pack, about that, uh, you're fine to run this airplane. You're not going to have any problems. But if you wanted the extra performance, like I, I, like I like running a bigger battery for more flight time and to get a little more punch. It gets borderline on that 65 amp limit, and in fact, I think I was drawing about 72 to 74 amps or something at full throttle static on the ground. So you're going to need at least an 80 to 85 amp speed controller, which I went ahead and put in mine, if you're going to use a larger battery. Again, the stock battery, you won't have any problems with this thing. Um, the next clip, I'm going to show you the speed controller I used. Really, any good brand that you have uh, with a good uh, BEC on it or a separate BEC will work out just fine. I used a Turnigy brand, uh, but uh, if you're going to upgrade your battery in this airplane, uh, this is something that you want to consider um, because because it has a larger prop, uh, you're going to get close to that 65 amp speed limit, and you may want to upgrade uh, uh, your speed controller as well. Now, this next clip will show you the speed controller I used, and it has so far worked out uh, quite well for me. Here's a quick look at the speed controller that I upgraded to, and again, uh, the stock speed controller is fine for this airplane if you're using sort of a stock size battery like a, you know, a 20C, uh, 2650 or something. But uh, I went up to the 85 amp here. Uh, it's called a TZ85. Uh, it's a Turnigy brand. Uh, you notice that I drilled some extra holes in the side for cooling uh, and in this side as well and uh, in this side also. Um, uh, I also, um, there's plenty of cooling holes on the bottom, but I also glued these little pads on here and uh, that keeps this whole thing from bottoming out uh, and blocking all of these lower cooling holes when it sits down in the fuselage. Uh, uh, again, this is what I used and I, f I found that uh, the, 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 the throttle response on this uh, speed controller is, uh, is very, very smooth and, uh, and uh, nice and linear. So uh, anyway guys, again, the stock speed controller works fine, but if you upgrade your battery, uh, this is the controller I used and it seems to work really well. The detail on this model is uh, pretty intense. They uh, have a lot of very colorful decals on it, uh, as well as a lot of uh, structural details. Uh, here's pretty much my completed uh, BF-109. Uh, it is just a super colorful and uh, just very good looking airplane all the way around. Uh, I'm real pleased with how it went together overall, and uh, uh, it's just a cool looking and a very good looking airplane. Let's take a look at some of the details that it has. First off, the main landing gear is probably one of the more scale details uh, that uh, FMS has been uh, vastly, uh, uh, probably leading the way actually I should say. Uh, uh, the, the outer rake of the landing gear, uh, the narrower attachment on the inside part is uh, really just incredible. Uh, they've also managed to make uh, scale wheels uh, and scale hubcaps and everything, scale doors, scale struts and uh, at the price you pay for this stuff, it's just some phenomenal, phenomenal detail. Uh, you can see it also has a, uh, an actual functional scoop underneath that actually goes up to the uh, 
ESC and the battery compartment and cools everything. You can see the uh, fine detail here of the exhaust pipes that come out that are uh, you know made out of plastic and uh, uh, the scoop for the turbocharger on the side. That's actually a functional scoop as well because it's open up to the battery compartment and to the ESC uh, compartment. Nice detail on the prop and the spinner uh, as we uh, move along down the fuselage here. Uh, great pilot detail and uh, instrument panel as well. Uh, more squadron insignias on the side uh, with the shield and the heart back there. Uh, but overall, uh, uh, this thing is just uh, incredible. The contrast and the detail and uh, how colorful this thing really is. Again, they painted the inside of the cockpit black. Uh, it's got wingtip lights all the way around. Uh, retractable main and tail wheel. Overall, I'm just really pleased with this airplane. Uh, it's just a very, very phenomenal um, uh, uh, package that you get for the money. One of the greatest details of uh, uh, all of the FMS models really are the landing gear. Uh, they have very scale wheels and very scale struts uh, that uh, really uh, duplicate uh, the original model. Uh, the original airplane actually is uh, pretty darn close. Um, they, they've been able to uh, achieve a, a pretty sound structure all these things by making this, um, this uh, uh, tray, which is actually a landing gear tray, or what I also call a liner. And uh, that helps distribute the whole load of this gear and makes it tough. Uh, also, metal trunnions in the, uh, in the uh, RC lander style gear that they put in here. And uh, uh, a nice three and a half inch wheel that should be able to really take almost uh, any, uh, any grass runway. Let's go ahead and uh, retract the wheels and take a look at them. All right, as you can see, uh, this is right out of the box, guys. No mods or changes I did to this thing. Uh, as with most of the landing gear from, uh, from FMS, everything uh, extends and retracts uh, real nicely. Let's go ahead and put it out. All right, guys, definitely, uh, definitely an A-plus on the landing gear on this thing. In addition to the main gear, uh, FMS is also giving you this really nice uh, retractable tail wheel. Uh, also a smaller RC lander uh, unit uh, that's in there. It has this little uh, V-notch uh, servo horn, a specially designed servo horn, uh, that lets that uh, pin engage and disengage when this thing extends and retracts. Let's take a look at it. All right, and as you can see, the servo still operates, but the tail wheel is now disengaged. And again, you have a nice uh, lander unit in there that's really tough and uh, very nicely engineered. Um, even if you're in a little bit of a turn and you're using a little bit of rudder and you extend your gear, you can see that that pin will uh, line up uh, even if it's not quite in the center because it has that V-type V type notch in there. Uh, once again, guys, A-plus for this design. It's a very functional, very, uh, very good tailwheel unit. Taking a close-up of the wingtip of the uh, BF-109, a uh, nice bright LED. You can see uh, mostly even during the daylight. Uh, they're great around dusk time, really helps with orientation. But all down the wing, uh, I really like all the colored uh, uh, tape that they have that covers over the trenches. And one of the neatest design features of this plane is the flaps. Uh, just like the real airplane has, um, you can see here that there is a, uh, an outboard flap that's actually a uh, plane flap, and the inboard that's actually a split flap. And they're joined together by uh, this previously, we talked about this, uh, um, a little uh, uh, joiner uh, linkage here. Let's go ahead and uh, extend it and you can see what I'm talking about. All right, they move together. There's a, land, there's a takeoff and a landing flap uh, um, uh, configuration. Uh, really nicely wired, nice small linkage, and all this stuff is uh, pre-installed. Nice flat hinges and everything. Uh, overall, uh, uh, a nice impressive feature, guys. Uh, when it comes to landing gear and it comes to uh, flaps, uh, there's no doubt that uh, kind of FMS, I think, is leading the way on this stuff. Uh, very scale, very high quality, and very functional. Once you get the canopy on, here's a real nice feature that they added. Um, you know, for the antenna, for the tail, they added this uh, little spring. Uh, and they, of course, included the antenna as well. So uh, that lets you take the canopy on and off and, uh, now have it attached, and not have it attached to the airplane. So you can take the antenna off, uh, as you can see here and uh, uh, you can put it on and off uh, as you need to. But uh, real nice feature, real nice detail. Somebody over at FMS is uh, really thinking about this stuff. Okay, guys, that concludes this video on the FMS uh, BF-109 uh, from Banana Hobby. I hope you found everything uh, real useful. Uh, all the changes that you guys just saw are everything that's incorporated into this airplane, and it's all worked uh, really well to keep everything cool inside and, uh, and uh, keep everything uh, working real well. Uh, one other item of note uh, that, I, that I do want to point out to everybody is uh, on top of all the other things I've said about this thing, 
it's quite a rugged airplane. So far, this airplane has actually done two cartwheels off the left side of the runway and rolled over our sort of plastic guard fence and uh, with little to no damage, just a few things glued back. And it actually has had a stall and a, and a, and a dive straight into the ground where we uh, uh, actually destroyed the spinner. But, uh, but this airplane is so rugged, I was kind of amazed at how well it took that abuse. Uh, you know, I, I just put the cowling back on and uh, put, got a new spinner and prop for it, and uh, it it has it just keeps on going, guys. So uh, as good looking of an airplane this is, this this airplane here has been through the meat grinder. It has been beat up and and flown real hard and even gone down a couple times, and uh, it like I said, it continues to fly. So it's a pretty good testament to these uh, FMS foam airplanes. If it had been a wood airplane, it would have been crumbled and gone. Uh, but because uh, of the good design of it and uh, the ruggedness of the foam and the flexibility of it, uh, you can do things like that to, to this particular airplane and a lot of the other FMS airplanes and just sort of glue them back together again. So uh, anyway, guys, uh, if you need to contact me, uh, check out rcinformer.com. Uh, my contact page, you can get a hold of me directly. Uh, and ask me any questions on this airplane or anything you may need help with, uh, just give me a call. Also check out uh, RC uh, Informer on Facebook. We have a, a more direct Facebook page. Uh, and if you guys ever need pictures of anything, I can Facebook you pictures real fast with my phone. If there's something that you need to see or something you're not sure about uh, how to get this thing going. Uh, anyway guys, uh, once again, thanks for checking out the video. Thanks for commenting and subscribing uh, to uh, the RC Informer YouTube channel. And uh, we'll see you next time.